Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Bob. Seriously alcoholic. Through the grace and power of a very loving God as I've that I've accessed through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, an ability to maintain a position of being sponsorable, commitments, dedicated home group, and bushels of newcomers. I haven't had a drink or any mind or emotion-altering substances since October 31st, 1978. And for that, I will always owe you my life. I... I am delighted to be here. I, I'm delighted to know that alcoholism kills people in Iceland just as much as it does in Las Vegas, as it does in London, as it does in Costa Rica, as it does in Japan, that all over this planet there are guys like me that will never get into these rooms, that will die of this disease. And that there, I get to be among some very fortunate people who have found, who've made it into Alcoholics Anonymous. And maybe if you're really lucky, you've gotten a foothold here and you'll be able to stay here. And I, if you, if you've gotten a foothold here, I encourage you with everything in me. Don't let any person, any idea, any resentment, anything drive you out of here because you're the only one that can leave and your res- and your judgments can can kick you out of here uh, I know that there are people in this room that are as in love with Alcoholics Anonymous as I am and how can you not love AA if if it does for you what it's done for me in 1978 I stood on a bridge with a bottle of Richard's Wild Irish Rose, the cheapest, most disgusting wine ever made. It's never seen a grape. It's all chemicals. It's just, it, it's a dollar twenty-nine a quart. I mean, it's if you're if you're if you're an economy drinker trying to get the most amount of alcohol for the least amount of money, that's what you ended up with. And I'm standing on this bridge in 1978, sobbing uncontrollably, because I can't seem to get up enough courage to take my own life. Because I'd been seven years of institutions, seven years of attempting to to turn my life around, seven years dying on the installment plan and trying absolutely everything I could ever try to turn this around. And uh, But I tried everything except AA, really. Even though I'd been to hundreds of meetings... I was part of a group that has existed in Alcoholics Anonymous since day one. And that's the group that, unfortunately, there's an aspect of that group in this room tonight. The ones that will die of this disease. And the the line of demarcation that separates the ones that recover from the ones that don't is talked about in the beginning of chapter 5. It's read in every meeting when it says... Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. And I went to hundreds of meetings in those seven and a half years, but I was part of that group. I couldn't buy the whole package here. I had too much judgment. I'm dying, and yet my ego, the more I'm dying physically, the greater, stronger my ego is becoming. And I was the kind of guy that I could I could ruin everything in my life and I could come into Alcoholics Anonymous and I could pick you all apart. And I couldn't do what you did and I was unsponsorable because nobody tells the great I am what to do. Right? And little did I, I could not see me the way that you could see me. Because if I could see me the way that you could see me, what I would see is I would see a guy, a pathetic guy, a pathetic egomaniac, insisting to be being at the wheel of his own ship 
regardless of at the wheel, he keeps running it into the rocks over and over and over. And I don't get it. It's because I'm in control. I get it. They're, they're putting rocks in the wrong place. Uh, you know, it's, it's the damn tides. It's, it's never, it's, it, it's me, but I can't see that. And I, uh, I fell into your hands one more time in this, in 1978, and I was, I was a broken man. And the thing that was broken was the only thing that had to be broken. It was that ego and that self-reliance. And I, thank God I had a, I think that the, re, the amazing recuperative powers of this al- alcoholic ego are amazing. And I had a small window where I was so demoralized and so beaten up that I was willing to get a sponsor and, and actually do what he said. I got commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous. I started doing things that a guy like me would never, ever do. And I did them without judgment. I did them out of absolute hopelessness. And my life started to change. Now, what brings a guy like me to that point? A guy that's as judgmental and as egotistical and as wanting to be in control as I do. What brings a guy like me to that point? Wasn't treatment centers. I've been through some of the greatest treatment centers. I've listened to the doctors and the psychiatrists. Not religion. I've been blessed and dunked and sprinkled and I mean everything you could uh, rededicate. I I think I was baptized enough times to have watermarks. I mean I just you know I, I none of that. Not the love of my family. Not that I didn't love them. I just that wasn't enough. And what brought me to the table in 1978, the last time, what brought me to that bridge in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, trying to take my own life, is that I was in a trap I could not spring. I was stuck. I seemed to have an absolute inability, no matter what I tried, no matter what I drank, no matter what I smoked, no matter what pills I took, I could not get back to the magic that I once found in getting high. And out of that, I was, I lived the last couple years of my drinking in a, in a, a bleak state of desolation where I would drink and I would feel sorry for myself. And I would drink and be full of self pity. And I would drink and hole up somewhere and go on crying jags. And I would drink and break furniture. And I would drink and end up in the emergency room of hospitals because I put my hand through a window and I can't stop bleeding. I uh, I would drink and I wouldn't bathe. I would drink and have and walk around in clothes full of body excrement because I didn't care anymore. I drank at the end, not for a party. I drank just to blot it out. Just to blot it out. And and the tragic thing about all of that was there was a time when alcohol was magic. And I'll get into that in a minute. But that in itself, the fact that my drinking was horrible wouldn't be enough to bring me to the place where I'm willing to buy the whole package of AA. Because some people drink until it's horrible, and you know what they do? They quit drinking. (laughs) Right? I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. Oh, it's drinking, you're horrible, quit drinking. The problem is I couldn't quit. I could quit for short periods of time. But something happens to me when I stop drinking, that is as is, is insane as the things, and maybe more insane than the things that happen to me when I do drink. And what happens is I enter into a state of abstinence, and if you're not medicating me or giving me anything, I'm just raw, natural. It's not good. <laughs> and I'm restless. I'm irritable. I'm discontent. I suffer from low-level depressions. I suffer from a loneliness 
that a that a man in my country is not supposed to even admit that he would feel because men are supposed to be above those feelings. I suffer from fears and, and petty childish anxieties that men are not supposed to suffer from. And I don't fit anywhere. And I, I, I don't drink day in and day out and week in and week out and month in and month out. And I just get it up to here with being sober. And I am not stupid. I understand that when I pick up a drink, I will burn my life to the ground. And yet I can't stop picking up a drink eventually. And I, of an alcoholic of my, thank you, of an alcoholic of my type, if you're the alcoholic that is in this book, the question with untreated alcoholism, the question without a sponsor, without God's grace, without the 12 steps, without people you're sponsoring, without the whole package, as it says in chapter 5, completely give myself to this simple program. The question for people like that who don't completely give themselves to the simple program is not if you're going to drink again. The question is when. It is an absolute inevitability. Now, it may take six weeks or it may take six years. But it's an inevitability because to have to have alcoholism of my type and to quit drinking is to create a is to create an itch in the middle of my being that I am compelled to eventually scratch. And I'll try to scratch it a lot of different ways before I actually pick up the drink. I'll try to scratch it with sex for a while. I'll try to scratch it with money. I'll try to scratch it with with material things for a while. I'll try to scratch it with being right and getting you to see how right I am. I'll try to scratch it by being a hard worker and being the, the, I'll be the workaholic, best worker there. I'll work myself into a state of an illusion of validation. I'll try to scratch that itch with everything I can scratch it because Dr. Silkor says that when I quit drinking, I'm restless, irritable, and discontent unless I can again experience the sense of ease and comfort. So I become an ease and comfort junkie. And I look for ease and comfort everywhere I can. And then what happens to me is after a period of time, whatever I've acquired and brought into my life that's supposed to pump me up, make me comfortable enough to be sober, what happens is the shine of it eventually wears off. And that's why, that's why people like us, we cannot stay sober through acquisition. Spiritual, this, this malady of my spirit that occurs when I stop drinking, this sick, disconnected feeling is never treated by addition. It's always treated by subtraction. Spiritual growth never comes by addition. It comes by subtraction. And that's why if you come to Alcoholics Anonymous and you remain a taker, I mean, all you're going to get here is alcoholism because that's all we got. <laughs> that's all we got. But if, if you want to change your life, you must come here and become the giver. And this is not, this, this does not equate with alcoholic mental mathematics that you give stuff away and your life gets better. It doesn't, I know it doesn't make sense. If you're new, you're, it, especially if you're new looking at the amends step and you're thinking, paying all this money back is going to make my life better? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I'm telling you, the things that, listen to this. Look at the things that you've done recently prior to coming into AA that made sense to you. How was that working for you? <laughs> so maybe if AA doesn't make sense, maybe that's a good idea. <laughs> maybe that's a better idea than what you've been trying. And alcoholics have done to make any sense. So I'm on this bridge because of two things. I can't jumpstart the party. I can't. I, I finally get it that no matter what I do, I cannot control and enjoy my drinking. I can't get back to the fun days. I can't get away with it. It's horrible. And I can't live without it. 
because abstinence feels like I'm doing time. And I can endure it for a while. See, I get like a mule in a hailstorm. I just hunker down and take it. But eventually, I get to that point where I just had enough. And I just, you know when that gets on you? That, 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 the thoughts and the obsessive thoughts with and yearning for the effect of alcohol. And what I really, what I, I, I don't crave and I'm not obsessed with actual beverage as much is the effect I'd once found in drinking. Where I, what I yearn for against this dead spirit that I have sober, what I really yearn for is that time in my life when I had the magic. That time in my life when I could have three or four drinks and it would just light me up. Where I could have three or four drinks and come out and play. Where I could have three or four drinks and I could be funny. I mean, I was funny. I wasn't, I'm not really funny, but I was funny when I was drunk. I could dance and I really can't dance. I could, I could be philosophical and deep. Remember three o'clock in the morning cracking the secrets of the universe? I'd say things, I'd say things that would blow my mind. I'd just go, oh, that was great. I could, I could talk to women when I was drunk. In the early days, not at the end. In the early days when the magic worked, I remember, I remember God had, uh, like when I was 18 years old, 19 years old, going to dances, getting lit up, drunk, parties. I'd start talking to some girl. And do you ever have the, the, the experience of almost stepping back from yourself and I'm watching myself say things to this girl that are just incredible? I'm thinking, oh, this is going to work. Oh, yeah. And it's, you know, it's, and I'm, where's this coming from? This is great. This is brilliant. Oh, this is amazing. I'm, I'm going to get late. This is good. This is, you know, and it's almost as if alcohol awoke something in my spirit and got me in touch with some sort of flow of power in this universe that did for me what I could not do for myself. It was amazing. And I'll tell you something, this will sound to some of you like AA heresy, but this is the honest truth. If I could get that effect and that magic from alcohol, I'd have never quit drinking. Matter of fact, I have a really good life today in sobriety. If God were to come in here today and say, Bob, I'll give you three more years like it was when you were 17, you may see a breeze as I hit the door. <laughs> now, I hope that wouldn't happen, but I don't know. I don't, because that, when that magic worked, man, it was awesome. It was incredible. I mean, if it wasn't for alcohol, I'd be celibate to this day. I really, I could have never gotten in a relationship with a woman. I was too afraid. I was too inadequate. I was too scared. I, I remember in junior high school, we used to have dances, right? You know, you're young teenagers, pre, you know, ad, you know, barely adolescents. And I remember going to this, this dance and I went there because there's a girl in my class that I have a crush on. And so I kind of have a mission. I'm there to want to dance with this girl. And I'd taken some guys that show me some dance steps and et cetera. And I go to this dance and I'm standing up against the wall of this gymnasium, like just terrified. And I'm watching them dance. And I'm going to, I'm trying to psych myself up to get enough courage to go ask this girl to dance. And I remember thinking, I'm sitting there, okay, okay, okay. I'm, oh, ask her, oh, ask her. Not this song, next song, next song, next song. Next song, come along and I go, no, next song. Next. I did that for a half hour. Finally, screwed up enough courage, walked across, asked her to dance, and she said no. And I got to walk back across that seven-mile gymnasium, and everybody's looking at me. I can feel them looking at me. And I know, and I can feel them thinking about me. Do you ever know what people are thinking about you? It seems like all of a sudden, the whole world stops, and everybody's thinking about me, you know? And I, and I walk... I walked back over to my wall and I stood there for about 10 minutes and I'm spinning in my head. Every time somebody looks my direction, it's like, oh, you know, I finally bolted out of there. Couldn't take it. I'll tell you something. I had never, ever done that again. I had never risked that again, except later on that year, I was at another dance 
under the power of 151 rum and Coca-Cola. And I must admit, I was smooth. <laughs> and I had a suave fair about me and a, and a confidence and everything just fl flowed. It was just like I was in the groove again. And women, I was asking girls to dance and they were saying yes. And if one said no, oh boy, is she missing it. <laughs> now that's power. That is power. That's, that's getting immersed in something that does for you what you can't do for yourself. And the naysayers and everybody would say, oh, that's just an illusion. I'll tell you, it was what it was better than what I had sober. Because I'd sober up and I'd go back to being me again. And I never liked that much, really. But at the end of my drinking, I can't get that back. I, I can't, no matter what I do, I can't get it. I can't stop remembering it. I remembered the glory days. I yearned for those days. I wanted them with everything in me. But once the, once alcohol stops doing something for you and only does something to you, there's never been a recorded case of an alcoholic of my type that's ever being able to get back on the other side of that fence. And most of us, millions of us, have lost our lives dying, and we've died of this disease, chasing the illusion that I can get back to the other side of that fence, that I can get back to those glory days. And it's pathetic, and I never could. Um... So I'm 1978, I'm standing on a bridge and I'm trying to take my own life. The book says it best in a vision for you. It says we get to a place where we can't imagine life with it and we can't imagine life without it either. And I was at that place. And I can't imagine life with it because it's bad now. And I don't drink. When I drink, I don't, I can't, I've never in my life been able to just drink for a while and then shut it down when you should. When I start drinking, I can't get enough. I've always been that way. I've never, never once in all my drinking because of this phenomenon of craving, because of this allergic reaction I have to alcohol. Once the buzz hits me, what that does in the, in the craving for more of that feeling, I have never once in my life been sitting in a bar or a party drinking for an hour, have the bartender come over and say, Bob, would you like another drink? I've never once sat there and honestly thought to myself inside, no, this is just right. <laughs> not once. Matter of fact, if, you don't, if you're sitting here and you're not sure if you have an, you're an alcoholic, there's a test in the big book. And the test is on, it's in the beginning of chapter 3, it says, if you're not sure if you're an alcoholic, go over the nearest bar, try some controlled drinking. The, the book says, try to drink and then stop abruptly. Well, it's not a good test, uh, really. And I wouldn't want to recommend it. You know, somebody might die. I don't, you know, you, some, I'll tell you something. I've seen evidence in my own life and the life of other people who've drank again that often the phenomenon of craving and, and you're is so strong within you and you don't even know it until you try to, until you start again and it just takes you over. And I wouldn't want to recommend the test. And besides, let's, let's imagine the test. It's not a viable test when you really think it through for a guy like me. If you have the same mind that I have, the test is, it's, it's, it's useless because here's what's going to happen. Okay. I'm going to go down here to the bar. I'm going to try to see if I'm an alcoholic. I'm going to have two drinks. That's it. Shut it down. Go home. You can't smoke nothing, take nothing, 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 two drinks. That's it. Well, about halfway through the second drink, it's going to become very apparent to me that this is a bad test day. <laughs> it's a good test, but this is not the day for the test because there'd be some girl in the bar. Oh, man, I got to have a drink with her. There'd be some guy come in. He's got some good stuff going on. Got to have a drink with him. Bad test day. And tomorrow, if I tried the same test, somewhere in the middle of that second drink, it's like a key turns in my head. And then all of a sudden, my total ability 
to rationalize, to justify, to minimize things in my life, to change my perception. Well, it'll do, my mind will do anything necessary to make it seem perfectly, perfectly reasonable to have another drink to satisfy a craving that's driving me that I don't even know is driving me. And I think the next drink's my idea. When I could have went into that bar swearing to myself, two and that's it. I can't do the two. Or if I do do the two, three hours later, I'm so irritable, I'm going back somewhere. Because it started an itch I got to scratch. And I can't live without it, so I'm stuck. And I'm trying to take my own life. And in a vision for you, it says we get to a place we can't imagine life with it anymore because I keep burning my life to the ground and I'm, I miss it. I'm, I'm shooting past. If there's a fun part in there, I shoot by it so quickly. I don't even see it. I just go, I just go from phenomenon of craving. It seems like to pathetic. I mean, I used to, I used to get two hours of fun before I got pathetic. I mean, I, I don't even get the two hours of fun anymore. I just get, I just go right to pathetic. <laughs> right? And, I can't imagine life with it, and I can't imagine life without it either. Because abstinence is not good for me. Abstinence feels sometimes like I'm dying of loneliness. And when I stood on that bridge trying to take my own life, I wouldn't have told you I was dying of alcoholism. It would have never occurred to me. Oh, I could admit, drinking's a problem. Yes, yes. Look, I got the DUIs. I've been in the institutions. I have to get detox. Yes, 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 yes. But that's not really the problem. I am absolutely convinced that's not really the problem. What I think I'm dying from is loneliness. And an absolute something, I suspect something is wrong with me. Maybe emotionally, maybe physically, maybe, maybe mentally. But there's something wrong with me that I, do, I can't connect with people sober the way they connect with. I don't fit in AA. I can't have relationships of, of any degree of intimacy and success that I see people having all the time. There's something wrong with me. I, I do bizarre things. My emotions are out of control often. I, I am moody sometimes. I can't control my feelings and my emotions. And sometimes these blue periods and, and, and other times bouts of anxiety and I get up tight and I can't see other people. You ever, when you're like that, and you look around you, it looks like everybody's fine. And then there's you. Right? Did you ever notice that? It's, it's really, the, the worst time to be, it's really bad in AA. If you, what's the worst is, is to be really, really depressed or just overcome with fear, locked in your own head. And then go to a really upbeat, spiritual, positive meeting. Where you just sit there and it's like, you just know there's something wrong with you that's not wrong with any of those people. You know, it's just a horrible feeling. And alcoholism is a disease of separation. And I drank to overcome that at one time. But alcohol doesn't help me anymore. I don't know what's wrong with me. But I don't think it's drinking. And it's not. What's really wrong with me is a malady of my being, of my spirit, called alcoholism. And if, if it would have been so simple that my problem was alcohol, then my first treatment center would have solved my problem. But I got something more insidious called alcoholism. The book says we get to that place, we can't imagine life with it, we can't imagine life without it. It says we'll know loneliness such as few do, We'll be at the jumping off place. I'm on a bridge. And we'll wish for the end. Oh, yeah. Do you know that in the Jelinek chart of the progression of the disease of alcoholism, it is only in the last stages of alcoholism, when you're just about dead, you're at a point where you're either better pretty quick recover or you're going to die, that alcoholics of my type start wishing we were dead or at least thinking we were wishing we had the courage to kill ourselves or even thinking. If you're sitting here and you've had thought, you've had thoughts and you've come two mornings and you wished you were dead or you've had those kind of thoughts and feelings, let me tell you, you may not, you may delude yourself into thinking that you're not that bad yet. Clinically, 
that's the last stages of alcoholism. The last stages. And I was in those last stages. I could, I was at the jumping off place. I wished for the end. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I, this is where, this is the state that I was in in 1978 when I came to you the last time. And this is really the state that it took me to break my self-reliance so I would stop being at the helm of my own ship and I could come into Alcoholics Anonymous and buy your whole package. You know, there's an old, I don't know about you guys, but I go on, I go out and get drunk and go on a run and alcohol may take everything away from me. I'll end up back in AA and the first thing I get back is my goddamn opinion. You know, that's just the kind of guy I am. I could be three weeks sober and all of a sudden I'm in charge again, you know, in my head, right? I know what's right. I know what I need to do. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, uh, that's the state I was in when I ended up in a hospital in 1978 in Las Vegas, Nevada. I was facing two years in a state penitentiary in prison. And I was on the run. They were looking for me. A judge had put me into a treatment center to see how I would do. And, and if I didn't do well, I was going to do the two years of prison. And I split town and got out of there. And I'm on the run and I'm facing the prison. I'm all alone. There's no one left in my life. There's no one to call. And I end up in a hospital in Las Vegas, Nevada, at that place again where I can't... I used to... I'm the kind of guy that when, at the end of my drinking, when you drink for oblivion and you're almost obsessed with blotting it out, what happens to me is I don't eat and I drink, I pass out, I come to, I drink, I pass out, I come to. And you do that for a while, and then you get to a point where you can't even fit. Your body just goes no more. And you try to drink, and it comes back up on you. And you try to get it down because you're shaking. You're going to jump out of your skin if you don't get enough alcohol in you to just to calm, to calm the insane nerves that are exploding within you. And I, and I had to go into a hospital because I was in dangerous seizures and and uh, in this hospital, something had happened to me. And I didn't understand it until I, I met a guy named Chuck Chamberlain. And Chuck talked about being surrendered by the bottle. And that's what exactly what had happened to me. I'm in this hospital. And I had this little window where enough of me had been beaten out of me to finally hear you. And for the first time in attending meetings in seven and a half years, the first time. I didn't run the little dialogue in my head, the critique over what you were sharing. I just sat there like a child and let your experience wash over me. And I remember sitting there and I found myself nodding my head and thinking secretly to myself, my God, I'm like these people. And that's not good news. I don't want to be like you. But I am, and I'm, I'm watching you. And you come, some of you came in to this hospital a couple times a week and brought meetings in there and took guys out to meetings. And I'm watching you, and you're, and, and I started to get that you were like me, but yet you're not anymore. And something has happened to you because you are something that you didn't used to be able to be, but you are now, and I can't get there. And you got there. And what you are is you're happy and sober at the same time. <laughs> I can't imagine that. I don't know. I don't get that. To me, AA has good news and bad news. The good news is that maybe if I went to thousands of those stupid meetings, I'd stay sober the rest of my life. The bad news, I'm going to live a long goddamn time. I mean, <laughs> I might, you know, I can't imagine life without it. But now I'm in a place where I can't imagine with it or without it. And I, uh, I got a sponsor, which is not, uh, not only did I get a sponsor, I was willing to do anything he said. And he said a lot of things that didn't make sense. But I just did them. I just did them. And I, I didn't know that I'd been surrendered. A friend of mine talks about surrender, and he says that if you ever watch the old war movies, when in, in wars, when, when, when soldiers surrender, 
what they do is they put down everything that they have with them that they can defend themselves with. Their guns, their knives, their, their hand grenades, they put it all, they lay it all down, walk away from it, and they sit down on the side of the road and they will sit there and wait for somebody to tell them what to do. And that's exactly where I was at in 1978. I put down all my judgment, all, all my uh, defense mechanisms. I just, I had that window where my ego was beaten out of me enough that you could tell me what to do. And I would do it. I would do it like a surrendered soldier that they say, go over here and stand there. I just go over there and stand there. They'd say, go to this meeting. Get there a half hour early. I just went to the meeting and got there a half hour early. They said, get down on your knees and pray. I said, okay, but I don't believe in God. They said, we don't care. Do it anyway. I just did it. They told me to stand and greet people and stick my hand out. They said, they told me, look for the new people. Look for the guys. They said, you've got four weeks now. Look for the guys that got one week that look scareder than you feel. Try to make them feel welcome. This guy says to me, he says, you may be the only person in the room that the experience of the awkwardness and the difficulty of getting sober is fresh enough within you that you can actually let this guy that's new know that he's not alone, that there really is someone there that knows exactly how he feels. And I started doing that, and I started taking some other actions in my life, and my life started to change. And I, uh, I often, and I started, you know, I started having these experiences. I was about a couple months sober, and I realized that I was becoming happy sober, and I didn't understand it. I was getting comfortable, and I was still periodically depressed and insane, but I was having windows in my life where I really felt enthusiastic about being here where I started to connect with people. I'd sit and go to coffee shops after meetings and, and get lit up with some of the conversations we'd have. I'd started feeling a part of. And, uh, you know, when you come off the streets and you're a homeless guy, uh, really, Alcoholics Anonymous gave me everything. People in AA gave me clothes to wear because I didn't have any money and I didn't have a job and I didn't have any clothes. They gave me cigarettes because I couldn't afford cigarettes. They gave me rides to meetings. And, and I walked and hitchhiked a lot, but they gave, me all, they gave me rides often. And they were very free with the most important thing that they ever had. They were free with their time and their attention. And they sat with me sometimes for hours in coffee shops. And one day, a guy gave me a bunch of clothes after a meeting, and he gave them to me. I'll tell you, there are people in Alcoholics Anonymous that are incredibly gifted and skilled lovers. Because you to love someone who cannot be loved and cannot accept love is an art form, really. And a guy, this guy came up to me named Tim, and I'll never forget Tim. And Tim has, has relapsed since then. He's had some struggles, but he's a great, great member of Alcoholics Anonymous at that time in his heart. And he came up to me after the meeting, and he says to me, he says, I really need your help. And I said, yeah, what, what do you need, Tim? He said, come on out to my car. I take takes me out to his car, and he opens his trunk, and he's got all these really nice clothing in there. He's got sport coats and pants and shirts, and they're just from the dry cleaners, and they're all folded, and they're all neat, and they're just, they're really nice. And he says to me, he says, you know, my wife is on my back about getting rid of some of this stuff. And I'll tell you, if I, if I can't get rid of it, I think she's going to divorce me. You could really help me out here if you could take this stuff. I thought, well, yeah. I almost said, do you, do you have a car you need to get rid of? But I didn't say that. I, didn't say that. I, just, I took the clothes. But he knew exactly how to give that to me. See, if he'd have come up to me in a meeting and said, I know you don't got anything, let me give you something. I, you know what I've done? I said, ah, I don't need nothing. Because I feel so unworthy of your help. And one of the things he gave me, he had a box of books. And I, I took these books home. He said he liked to read. And I, I like to read. I'm a reader. Some people watch TV. I, I kill time by reading. And I started reading this book that it was not AA. It was not recovery. It was not even a self-help book. It was just simply a very simple novel. And I was reading it for entertainment. And I got to a part of this novel 
that just blew my mind. And it, all of a sudden, when I read this, I connected the dots and I understood exactly what had happened to me. I understood all of a sudden why now I'm able to come to the table in AA and I couldn't before. And here's what I read. I read about this account of these scientists that were doing experiments on the human brain. And they discovered in the human brain was a part that in the book had a Latin name, but they called it the pleasure center. It's the part of the, pr the brain that allows you to experience the euphoria from alcohol and drugs. It's where you get high in your mind. It's what enables you to feel that feeling. And so what these scientists did is they took these laboratory rats and they put two tiny wire filaments into the pleasure center of the rat's brain, and then they would pass a mild, undetectable charge through those wires to stimulate the pleasure center of the brain. And when they did that, they discovered that the rat got high. So what they did is they took the, they took the juice and they hooked it up to a pedal in the rat's cage, and the rat would learn he could hit that pedal and get high. So the rat would just lay on the damn pedal. I mean, you know, he's, he don't eat. He don't drink water. He don't even have sex. He's, he's too busy. I'm not now, baby. I'm partying. He just keeps hitting that pedal. Hit that pedal. Hit the pedal. Hit the pedal. And he would do that until he died. Usually of either starvation or dehydration. Because he wouldn't even drink water or eat. He just hits that pedal. Now, most alcoholics get that. Matter of fact, I can see by the glazed eyes of some of you, there's some rats in this room tonight. I mean, you get that. But, but that's, not, that's not what really hooked me and got me. What I start, then what happened is I started reading about these, sci these same scientists would wait until a rat was just about dead. And right before he's almost dead, they would turn the juice off. And this time the rat would go back and he'd hit the pedal and nothing would happen. And he'd hit it again and nothing would happen. And again and again and again and countless futile attempts to turn the juice back on until he finally got to that place where he got it, that there is no more juice that the party's over. And instead of being able to go back to being a rat, he would curl up in a ball and lay on the floor of the cage to die. Because without the juice, there's nothing to live for. And I'm reading that and I'm crying because I'm not reading about no rat. I'm reading about me. That's exactly how I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't come, I, I didn't come here in 1978 for sobriety or spirituality or, uh, oh, I just want a sponsor or, or just let me at those amends, please. Or, or do you have an inventory I can write? I mean, nah. Oh, I just want to sponsor people. No, I don't want, I don't want any, I don't want any of that. I'm here out of an absolute lack of alternatives. I can't, I can't get back to the good old days, and I can't live without it. I'm stuck, and I'm desperate, and I started following your directions. If, if God would have appeared before me in my early sobriety and said, Bob will give you one wish, it wouldn't have been sobriety. Ah. You know what I would have said to God if I could have, if I could have sorted out my mind and would have known that, what to really ask for what my heart desired? I would have said, God, give me three years of drinking like I had when I was 18 years old. You give me those three years, you can kill me at the end of those three years, but I want those three years. I want to sit with the bands again. I want to dance. I want to get laid. I want to have fun. I want to be able to come out and play. I want to laugh, God. I want to be like I used to be. But instead, I got a big book and a sponsor and a... <laughs> Not what I would have asked for. <laughs> and if you're new, I, I, what I'm about to say, I, I hope you hear this. And even if you don't, even if you, you hear it and you have a hard time believing it, I want you to know something. I'm not a salesman for Alcoholics Anonymous. What I'm about to tell you is absolutely my honest experience. I believe that Alcoholics Anonymous the process in these 12 steps, when put into action by an alcoholic who's desperate, that everything we do in here, having a sponsor, helping others, service commitments, everything, 
is to one end and one end only. And it's not to get you to quit drinking. Want to quit drinking? Punch a cop. You'll quit drinking. (laughs) What Alcoholics Anonymous is designed to do is to turn the juice back on. It's designed to create a transformation and a rearrangement very slowly within me until someday what happens, and I don't, it happens for every one of us, and it's usually somewhere after we've been through the 12 steps, we've survived the first couple hurdles as our ego has come back and tried to run the universe again and starts judging everybody. It usually happens when we've settled in here and we're sponsoring guys and we love them and we get to we're watching guys get their kids back that could never see their kids. We're watching guys buy their first home that were homeless three or four years before. We're watching the hand of a loving God in not only in our own lives but in the lives of others. And what happens is that I start to realize that some that I am alive today and vital in a way inside myself. In, in relationship to this world that only ever happened for me, and I only ever felt like this on small little occasions with just the right amount of vodka and just the right amount of drugs when I had the balance just right. That what I've really duplicated in Alcoholics Anonymous slowly is I've recreated the experience that I drank for, except that this is substantial And I never have gone to jail for helping too many people in AA. (laughs) But I've gone to jail for seeking that other solution well beyond the point where it worked. There's, there's tough, there's tough times in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's tough times in life. Bill Wilson, in his story, Bill was prophetic. At times, you know, I, 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 think, I think in every generation, sometimes there's one person born into every generation that has been given something. And sometimes they're very flawed people. Sometimes they're really warped people, but they got something. And it's almost like inside them is, is a portal to something greater than themselves. And they're inspired people. And those inspired people can make leaps and come to conclusions and see things that other people can't see. And Bill Wilson was one of those people. When Bill Wilson is just a couple of years sober in his story, he wrote about something that hadn't even occurred to him yet. And yet it was going to be something that was going to be true for him years later and also true for every one of us that stayed in these rooms long enough. And what he says in his story, he says, unless the alcoholic, can enlarge his spiritual life through self-sacrifice and work with other alcoholics, not through prayer and meditation, but through self-sacrifice and work with other alcoholics, Bill says he will never survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. Certain, like, just hold in, hang in there, because they're coming. They're coming. And Bill hadn't even got to his depression yet. Bill hadn't even got to his low spots yet. Bill's alcoholism hadn't even started to kick his butt again as it would a few years later. And the same thing that saved, that saved, he talked about would save him, save me in my 11th year, my 15th year, my 19th year. I want to tell you, so I'm going to talk some about, take a couple minutes and talk about something I haven't talked about in a long time. And I don't know why I'm talking about this, except that I have a sense that there's somebody in this room that for some reason I won't understand needs me to talk about this. When I was 11 years sober, I was married to a gal that I probably would have stayed married to the rest of my life. And I had just had a baby who was a little, a little daughter named Katie, who's a little over a year old at the time. And I was there at the birth and she took my heart. And I've never had another human being get inside my heart like my daughter did. And I, I became frightened after she was born and I worked, started working harder. And I, 
and I was trying to to build a, a sense of security for her and her future and, and my my wife and and in the process of that and also my my fervent commitment to Alcoholics Anonymous because I've never I've never gone to less than eight meetings a week I've never had not had H and I commitments I've always I I get it you you relapsed for seven and a half years. You get it that you can't back. You can't. There's no backing away from this. My life's on the line here. So in the process of all of that and building a business and all of that, my wife and I started to get a little estranged. Not fighting. No, no battles. Just a little bit of distance going on. And but I tell you, one of my defects of character is that my self-centeredness often takes the form of I just get so wrapped up in my stuff I don't pay attention I don't get it that there's a problem because I'm so wrapped up in my business and my stuff I'm doing, my AA stuff that I don't see that there's a a problem in this marriage until one day my wife comes to me and she says I want a divorce okay, I'm not a rocket scientist but I get there's a problem, All right, there's a problem so I said, why well, took me by, it took me by breath. I said, what do you mean you want a divorce? She said, I'm just not happy here. So I said, well, let's try some counseling or something. She agreed to go to some counseling and we started some marriage counseling. And the therapist is saying, well, why don't you try this and cut down on your meeting? So I try that. Nothing seemed to change. Why don't you try doing this once a week together? I did, did that. Nothing changed. We could not overcome this separation. This, it wasn't a hostile separation. It was just a, like a, an abyss between us emotionally. And I, my sponsor, my first sponsor at the time had retired and he bought this big art bus and he was touring around the country. So I, I'm not in touch with him anymore. So what I'm using to share these, my difficulties with all of this is one of the guys I sponsor who was like one of my top sponsees, a guy named Craig. Calvin knows him very well, and, and Craig and I would I'd go and I'd tell him about the difficulties in the, that I'm having in the counseling and in the marriage, and he was my confidant. Well, we got to a point where my wife comes to me one day, she says, I don't want to go to the counseling anymore, I just want out. Well, I live in Las Vegas. You can get a divorce so quickly in Las Vegas that you're, you're, you're single for three weeks before you pay the credit card bill on the divorce. I mean, you know, it's that fast. And I got a divorce. I, the divorce was final on a Thursday. The next day, Friday, I find out that my wife and daughter move in with Craig, my sponsee, my confidant, my very best friend. And all of a sudden, I discover that they had been sleeping together for the last year of my marriage, since right after my daughter was born. Now... You've been telling me in Alcoholics Anonymous for this time by over 10 years that there's no such thing as a justifiable resentment. Well, I got one now. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I'll tell you how sick I am. I'm sick on an intuitive level. And I, what I mean by that, I can walk into a room, 50 people, and I'll just intuitively know the person to go to that I can tell my tale to, and they'll go, oh, and they did that to you, and, and the, and the, Nail holes from the cross would get a little bigger in my hands. You know what I mean? And I started getting really sick. But thank God, I, in my fifth year of sobriety, my alcoholism overcame me, and I went back through the steps in this book. Thank God I had learned how to do the fourth step and what it talks about on page 66 and 67. And also, thank God that I had never stopped doing 12-step work and sponsoring people and having commitments in H&I. Because I want you to know something. If I hadn't been doing or had done all of those things, I would be a dead man. I would have died in that period of my life. It would have ate my lunch. Because I had a resentment that was an obsession. And I couldn't get it off of me. And I'd go to meetings and people, I'd just be crazy. It was the first thing I would think about when I opened my eyes in the morning. It was the last thing I thought about before I went to sleep at night. And it would just eat. It was like a tapeworm eating my heart all day long. And it was making me sicker. And, and, I, and I, I knew that the answer was in the fourth step. The freedom 
was in the was the, the demantle the dismantling of my judgment against them and seeing the truth. I knew that there was a truth in there that I was not looking at. But there was a period of time where I was too it was on me and I couldn't look. And what got me through that period of time was twelve step work. And thank God I sponsored God. And I'll tell you how God works. If if you're if you're diligent, when Bill said that this that helping others will get you through the certain trials and low spots, it was like all of a sudden I'm a magnet for every divorced guy in AA. I tell you, every broken relationship, I got five or six of them in my car within three weeks, and we're driving to meetings. We're like the depressed section of the meeting, you know. <laughs> We'd go to these discussion meetings. I, this is not this. I I say I remember this like it was yesterday. We went into this discussion meeting. They're all we're all mopes, you know, all feeling sorry for ourselves. We're all sitting over, and I heard the secretary of the meeting tell the chairman, "Don't call on those guys. They're gonna get." <laughs> But those guys got me through it. And until I could come back and do this process. There was a day when I, I went to get my daughter and I had to go over to their house where they're living together and pick her up. And we went in the car and I went to a friend of mine who had a ranch so she could she could ride some ponies. And she had a good time and we're sitting on this picnic table in the barnyard outside the corral. And I went over, she wanted something to drink. And there was a soda machine next to the corral. And I, I went over to get her a, a pop, a soda can. And, and I'm coming back. And, and the woman who's with the horses says to my daughter, Katie, she says, Katie's only less than, not quite two years old, about two. And she says to Katie, Katie, here comes your dad. And Katie says, that's not my dad. My dad is Craig. And it felt like somebody had put a knife in my heart and twisted it. And I went and I smiled and I gave her a hug and I, I pushed that pain down inside of me. And I went to take her home that night. And I remember this like it was yesterday. I remember driving up to her house and walking her up, holding her hand and walking her up to the front door. And, and the door opened and, and my ex-wife and him are standing there and he jumped and she jumps into his arms. And I remember saying goodbye and walking down that that walk and getting into my car and sitting there for a minute, I'm saying to God, I'm saying, God, I can't do this anymore. God, you have mistaken me for someone a lot stronger than this. I love my daughter, but I can't take this anymore. And I didn't want to stop seeing her, but it was so painful. And I had to go meet a new guy. I was only sober a couple months and I went oh, I drove over and he gets in the car and he gets in the car and he starts crying and he starts telling me how the courts had denied him visitation of his kids one more time and I sat there and I thought I get it I get it and I was able to keep showing up and going back into that household and picking up my daughter and loving her and until I was finally able to do what it talks about on page 66 and 67 of the big book, where the real freedom comes. And it's said in there to do something that uh, egomaniac people like myself who really enjoy the, the, the su feeling of superiority through the judgment don't like to do. And what that is, it says, and this was our course, it's, it says that I got to realize something. I got to make something real. I got to connect the dots in a way that I've never wanted to. I have to realize how I am like these people. I got to get that if I was in their shoes, can I really understand how my fears, my insecurity, my loneliness, my frustration, my resentments, everything that was going on inside of them that could be going on inside of me, can I get it? I could have done the exact same thing. Or am I too vested in being right about them and feeling smugly superior? Or can I get honest enough with myself to see how under the right set of circumstances I could have done it? Can I understand? Can I look at it as the book says, are we prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle? Can I look at it now through their eyes? 
what if I were to look at it through my ex-wife's eyes, what would I have seen? Well, I'll tell you what I would have seen. I would have seen a gal who wasn't vested in AA like her, the husband she married, who built her whole life around this relationship and this marriage. And after a period of time, she found herself married to a guy who just wasn't there very much. And she didn't have a sponsor. She didn't have commitments in AA, and she didn't sponsor anybody. She was one of those people that just kind of came around AA and didn't drink. She didn't have any of the tools in place that I had. And everything that she looked for to fill her vacancies was me, and I wasn't there. I was working 70, 70, 80 hours a week. I had another 15 hours of commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd come home late at night so worn out, I'd just fall asleep in the, in the chair sometimes. And I started to get a sense of her desolation and loneliness. And when I really got it, and I could really emotionally stand in her shoes, you know what I, th I thought? I thought, oh my God, I, could, I would have done the same thing. I might have even done it sooner than she did. And I started to also understand how I would have felt about myself as a result of those actions. And I'll tell you, Karen and I are very, very good friends today. And she suffered intensely from those actions. Almost took her out. See, she paid, she reaped the same rewards from that as I would have reaped if I would have done it. There's no free lunch here. And I could really see myself in, and I could see myself in him. And, and I sponsor him again. He was easy to see myself in. Because I remember one time, in early sobriety, he was always a lonely kind of guy. He couldn't get in a relationship. He couldn't get anything. Else. He said to me one time, he said, God, I'd sure like to have what you and Karen had, like what you have with Karen someday. I didn't know he meant specifically. I just, <laughs> I thought he meant in a generalized way, you know. But I know, I'm a guy. I know how it is. There's a time with guys when you, you're, you can have the most noble intentions in the world. And you're with a girl, and all of a sudden she opens a door and starts making certain moves, and you just wonder, where did those intentions go? <laughs> right? And I know, as a guy, I have done, found myself in situations doing things in my life that later I really regretted. And Craig really regretted it, and he got stuck in that. And he was lucky to survive it. And I sponsor him again today. And I got free of that through this thing in, in here. We live in a dangerous age. In the history of the planet, there's never been an effective treatment for alcoholism like we have today in Alcoholics Anonymous. But Alcoholics Anonymous has got a big major problem. It's full of alcoholics. <laughs> and we are the only species on the planet that's capable of shitting where we eat. <laughs> And we live in a world today where there's people trying to tear us apart and take our inventory and take the inventory of our founders and as if the whole thing's fat, it's all bogus and discount AA and all that kind of stuff. If you're dying of alcoholism and you got a foothold here, don't listen to any of it. Put your head down. Humbly walk under the grace of a power greater than yourself. Practice these principles. Look for the next guy who, or gal who suffers from alcoholism. Stick your hand out to him. Give him what you found, because if you don't, you won't be able to keep it. And join this thing. And let the, let the other people pick it apart. There's two different types of people in AA. There's those who do and those who judge. The judges are too busy to do unless it gratifies their ego, unless they're a big shot. And the doers are too busy doing to judge because I don't have the time to. I got the next guy. I got the next fifth step to hear. I got to go down to detox. I got to go to the county jail. I got to answer the phone. I got 20 guys waiting to talk to me because they're in trouble. And I don't have time. Stick with those people. Because in the test of time, I've been here, I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous continuously sober for over 27 years, but I've actually been here 30-some years. 
And in the test of time, the members that put their head down, help the next drunk, say the next prayer, go to the next meeting, write the next inventory, and don't get involved in any other stuff. Just remember, you have been saved from an alcoholic death and given a purpose. And that purpose is primary. It's more important than serving anything else. Because as an alcoholic, I'm going to serve something. And I'll either serve a purpose and an ethic greater than myself, or I will serve myself. But I will serve something. And put your head down and help that next drunk. And join us. And I'll tell you something. If you are like me and you find even a little bit of what I found here, you will spend the rest of your life looking for opportunities to help God's kids because you know you owe. Thank you for my life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.